Welcome to Social Media and Media uh, 2013 edition. <coughs> My name is Heather Schmelzlin, and I am the Social Media Content Editor at the Post Gazette. And your panelists for today are... Hi, I'm Kim Lyons from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Hi, I'm Bobby Cherry from, uh, from Trip Total Media. I'm Josh Rollerson from WESA. Uh, Mike Powell from the County Times. And then you are Nina from Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Oh, we have another one. David, hello. Hi, I'm Dave Singer with uh, KDK Radio. All right. We have some questions prepared, and we'll also take questions uh, throughout the panel and after. And uh, you can also tweet your questions at Kim with the hashtag PCPGH8. All right, to start, just gonna get this out of the way. Uh, paywalls. The Post Gazette just uh, put one up. Beaver County Times has had one up for a while, as has the uh, Observer Reporter. So, let's hear how does it affect your social media efforts? How has it so far? I'm gonna defer this one to me, unless she really oversees the social media. But well, um, it's. It remains to be seen since we launched our paywall on Tuesday. Um, it doesn't, I think it doesn't affect us uh, only in terms of uh, the strategy because now our social media links are all free and d don't count against your, at this point, 10 page view limit um, a month. So whatever you click um, from Twitter or Facebook or Tumblr, or you know any other social media um, platform, you will not that that will not get counted against your limit. So uh, we do try to spread as much con distribute as much content as possible via social, and I think that it will only energize our efforts on that front because we do we would like to keep you know. Um, people attracted to our content um, and give uh, as much exposure as possible to what our reporters and editors are doing at the Post Gazette. Our paywall is set up a little bit differently. Um, most of the stuff is free for 24 hours. There are a few categories of the content that are behind the wall all the time. Um, including cops and court stuff, which presents a problem if I'm trying to, to publicize these. Uh, I've learned, I, I don't worry about it so much with Twitter, but I, I, people, when you post uh, links that lead to the wall on Facebook, people get really upset um, and, and let you know about it. So I, I've uh, kind of adjusted, uh, if something breaking is going on, um, I, I can post an image and, and, and tell people this is coming, visit the site, um, uh, but but I try to avoid the actual link that's going to send people crashing into the paywall and and, and bring me a torrent of abuse uh, on our Facebook page. So it's it's a, it's some stuff that I'm, I'm trying to juggle a little bit and learning as I go. But um, this definitely made me uh, adjust uh, what we do. Yeah, me too. Hi, for public radio, we don't really have a paywall as such, but uh, other than that we come on the air twice a year and ask for your money, which is going on right now. I was just going to say that you know, I think it presents challenges not only for social, but as far as you're competing against another or several other organizations in town that may or may not have a similar system, but it's up to newspapers and other news outlets to figure out how to be profitable, how to, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're businesses, um, you know, some of us are for profit, some of us not, but we have costs to cover and bills to pay. You know, whether or not a paywall is the best model, I don't think that anyone has the answer to that yet. I think larger outlooks like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal have had success, but the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. So I think with paywalls, you have to have inherent flexibility. You have to be willing to tweak what's not working and, and find ways to um, make, get your content to people who need it and want it without presenting too many barriers. Otherwise, you have to go back to the drawing board because people, they have a low patience to hold for this kind of thing, I think. Um, what has the response been like from readers so far? Those of you who 
I would pay well. Mila, what has the response been like for meters so far? Mila's done a lot of the research. <laughs> She's done a lot of the research and really compiled a lot of the data. Uh, so well, you know, it's actually interesting. Um, I think that a lot of people, well, just today I was um, go, coming here on the bus and the bus driver said, um, so are you having fun tonight? And I said, well, I'm actually going to a work-affiliated um, conference. And he goes, where do you work? And I go, the Post-Gazette. And he's like, oh, are you guys still in business? <laughs> and <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And he goes like, not with the price that you charge for digital. And, um, you know, there has been uh, really a, back, a sort of a, a very strong reaction from the community where people are saying, how, you know, your price is too high, or, you know, what kind of content are you providing that we couldn't, we can't get from your competitor. And, um, but there are a lot of people who have been supportive, and actually when you break down uh, based on demographic analysis, you would find that uh, women are more supportive of the paywall than men are, um, at least based on the comments that we received. Um, when I sort of provided that analysis, you know, I received such a response, are you suggesting that women are more reasonable? And um, I wasn't suggesting that, but the research is yes. saying that, <laughs> that um, women are controlling, so, controlling the family budget because, you know, they do care about the uh, social, the uh, school board meetings, they do care about what happens in the city council, they do care about their health care plans. Not suggesting that men don't, but they are, you know, um, they do take uh, the decisions on which the sort of family uh, budget planning um, is, uh, you know, linked to. So um, it's been really interesting to see uh, the response from the community. I also think that uh, the challenge is still uh, for um, multiple departments at the Post Gazette to figure out how to stand out and strive for, you know, excellence and the exclusive content that people cannot get elsewhere. So uh, it remains to be seen, but so far the response has been, you know, really. Um, uh, there are different people who react differently, and there has been. Um, some support, but there has been a lot of, you know, goodbyes. So, what, what you might find is that uh, some of the people who are saying goodbye are, are going to come back. Um, but for the first month after we put up a wall, and that was this was back in the spring. Uh, the, the reaction was was predictably ugly. Um, but I know some of the people that, that I had discussions with about the wall who you know, just dismissed me in, in April or May, said, I'm, I'm never going back to your site, I'm not going to read your paper, I'm not doing anything. They've come back. I can, I can see that they've signed up. I can see they're commenting on stories. Uh, they at least have a digital subscription. Um, the, uh, the data that, that we've been looking at uh, since, it, since the, we've put the wall up shows that um, web traffic is, is returning again and uh, that the paywall is doing the things that it's supposed to do um, and actually is doing it a little more quickly than, than we expected. Um, so if your experience is, is going to be like ours, you're going to get used a lot for about a month and then, and then stuff will start to turn around. Um, people become uh, more accepting of the idea uh, and and, and some of the, the, the ugly stuff that happens right at the beginning really, really slows down. I do have a couple questions that get tweeted with the hashtag, and one, a couple, several of them are about price. And as R stands now, it is a monthly um, subscription. Um, it depends on what package you buy, whether you buy print and digital, whether you buy digital only. Um, you know, there's been a lot of questions to us about why don't you have a yearly subscription, and I think those are all things um, being looked at not part of my department, but um, that's how ours is, is based right now. You pay a um, monthly subscription and you get um, unlimited content um, based on the subscription you have. And then someone else asked, um, Aviary Erica, who uh, is one of my Twitter favorites, I haven't heard her in person yet. Um, she asked if reporters are pulling stories from direct tweets in addition to press releases or media advisory. Um, you know, I can't speak for all reporters, and not all reporters at the Post Gazette are on Twitter. I would think that um, you're making contact with a reporter on Twitter is a good way to introduce yourself. 
but I don't think any any um, reporter is going to use solely use a tweet as a source of information. Any good reporter would verify or or check corroborate information as you would with a press release or as you would with any other news tip that you get. I think it's a great way to introduce yourself to someone who's active on Twitter. But um, you know, all reporters have different levels of activities. Some are more active in the morning. Some are more active during the traditional work week. Some are on 24/7, like myself. Um, but I think. If you're going to use that as a way to disseminate information, um, it would be wise to follow up uh, because I don't think it's going to be your, you're not going to get, um, it's not going to be the only way to get an, an reporter's attention. It's a good way to get introduced, but not a good way to, um, it shouldn't be the only way you get in touch with that reporter. Okay. Let's talk social media strategy. Uh, what is your personal strategy and uh, how invested is your news organization in engagement? Well, I guess we could just start at the end and go down. But, um, my personal strategy is you have to have a personality. It's social media. You can't tweet out links to just your stories. You can't tweet out links to just your publications uh, stories. Uh, but you should do that. You should engage with people. You should have a sense of humor. Uh, people should, when they meet you in person, having only known you from Twitter, they should have a sense of who you are to surprise them what your sense of humor is like. Um, I think. You know, I'm someone who has uh, a personal account, which is sort of for friends only, where I, I swear a little bit more than I do on my work account. Uh, and then one where I'm, I'm more, it's more my professional persona, but I still try to, you know, conduct myself in a way that, you know, I, I don't follow people who just broadcast their own information, who broadcast their own links and don't interact and don't engage, because it's boring. Um, I don't, it, it's not what appeals to me. Uh, so. I think you have a personality, but use common sense, you know, and, and, and interact with people that you find interesting and interact with you. Yeah, the mindset that um, I tend to use with um, the way I use Twitter professionally through for work, um, and, and what we try to tell our reporters is, it, it is another, it is an extension of our publication. Um, it's not a newspaper, but it's an extension of what we do. So you want to, you know, come off being professional. You want to come off being the reporter that you are. You want to come off showing that you are, you can have fun and that you can cheer for the pirates, you know, and be sad when AJ Burnett blows the game, you know. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, talk about um, personal things or, or swear or you know, just just you want to make it tactful, basically. And so. That's that's kind of the strategy in terms of what what I share, what we share. Um, for from my train of thought is, you know, you don't always need to share links, like Kim said. Sometimes there are stories where if it's just a traffic alert or something, or I'm driving by a, a crash or something, I'll, I'll tweet about you know the incident or what's closed. It, at the end of the day, it's not going to drive all up traffic to the site if it's just a quick you know fender bender on 65 or something like that. But it's going to allow um, people on Twitter to to see you, to see that you're tweeting, to see that you're always engaging with what's happening in the community, and it's it's sort of that you know you remain familiar in the minds of people on Twitter. There are hundreds and thousands of tweets that go through you know every day, and so it's about seeing, it's about pulling those tweets in and, and being able to to find what's relevant to what you need, and, and that's sort of my thing. I mean, I, I tweet I think in my sleep sometimes. So, um, you know, it's about always being being online and ready to, you know, to to, to give the information that's needed um, for whatever the case is. I kind of wear a, a couple of different hats, you know, in, in my work. Uh, one of them is journalists, and so I think in, in that capacity, I'm using Twitter similarly to the way that uh, a lot of these guys are. Although my uh, I'm kind of doing it during a particular window of the day when I'm also on the air. So there's a balance that has to be struck between you know on-air duties and various other things that are going around. So uh, there's a tendency for it to be a little distracting. You try to control that. Um, but the other way in which I use it is sort of a, and I guess an extension of my personality as a host. There's a particular public radio voice that you want to kind of emulate. There are some things that you want to remark on that maybe it, it, it isn't an appropriate fit, or it just simply doesn't fit within the time you have available. So I find that Twitter is a 
an outlet for that. I'll echo what Kim and Bobby have said about, um, about finding the right voice and finding the right balance between the professional tone and sort of the playfulness. And you also want to kind of signal, you know, I use this medium, I'm familiar with its conventions, I know how to speak this language, which is something you can't really do in broadcast either necessarily. You can't really drop a lot of hashtags in your news copy. Um, so I find I switch back and forth between those a lot. And in our newsroom, it's, uh, it's really a process of experimentation. Uh, we had a lot of people come in from a lot of different places all at the same time. We had kind of a broad directive to you know, be engaged in social, be digital, be out there. But uh, not a lot of top-down you know, instruction on how exactly to do that. We're working that out right now. We're developing a social media strategy. In some ways, it's been nice that we don't have one on paper. We're kind of figuring it out for ourselves. So different people use it in different ways. Um, Clark and Paige Jacobs, our afternoon anchor, all things considered host, uh, she is a hardcore news junkie, and she just sort of does the aggregator thing. She tweets a lot of links. Um, she finds things that might otherwise fall through the cracks um, and passes them on. Uh, a lot of people are finding value in that, I think. Uh, Deanna Garcia, one of our reporters, uh, is very active on Twitter. and. Uh, she tweets from the field when she's reporting. She also just kind of does silly personal tweets. I think she strikes the balance pretty well. She can get a sense of who she is as a person, but in a, you know, in a way that's appropriate. It's not off -putting. Um That's yeah. That's kind of what we're doing. We're still uh, we're still figuring it out. Having fun with it though. We don't have a formal policy either, and, and I think it's mostly been left up to me to figure out what that's going to be, if we need one or not. Um, so there, there are a couple things that I, I try to do. Um, I, I try to be, to maintain a consistent voice across the different platforms. Um, when I'm doing most of the, the, the tweeting and Facebooking, that's not hard. Uh, but we have marketing folks, for example, uh, who get involved with the Facebook page and I, I spent a lot of time talking with them about about the voice and you know we can we can write this so it doesn't sound like so much that you're being pitched even though we'll get the one that you're being pitched um, I, I also uh, uh, what everyone has said about personality um, that's that can be a tough thing to do sometimes but um, I, I like I, I like the tone of what we do to be a, a little casual, a little playful. There is room in 140 characters uh, to offer some kind of some some commentary about the things that are going on, um, and, and sometimes it's not appropriate. But when when I have the chance, I I, I, I do that. Um, so at, at some point we may have formal policy, and I guess it's it's sort of just uh, what we're going to develop uh, over time. Um, but for right now. Uh, everyone seems to be more or less on the on the same page as far as uh, being consistent, uh, be approachable is a word I, I use a lot, and I think we do a decent job of, of uh, finding that voice. I think that in, uh, from the standpoint of delineating between social media policy and social media strategy, um, we do not have a formal social media policy, but we did have uh, some problems in the past um, at the Post Gazette, where you know um, we do have sort of um, an understanding, a common understanding that um, whatever you do on social should be just reflection and extension of your uh, professional uh, work. And um, we did have some reporters who have got in trouble. Um, because of what they tweeted, um, but you know that which warrant which warrants I think uh, social media policy in any news organization or um, an organization in general. I think there should be a common understanding that you know everything that you do online just assume that it's public, no matter you know what security settings you have, and I think that. Um, uh, people who have been online and have been active on social media, they um, understand that, uh, but not everyone. So you sometimes do need to spell those rules out. We do have around 54 reporters and editors who are on Twitter. Um, some of them are more active than others. Some are still trying to figure it out, you know, but, and there's some struggle on making them join. So, you know, one of the reasons why uh, the, the social links are not paywalled it, it was because to provide additional motivation for reporters to sort of 
uh, serve as newsstands of, um, you know, the digital newsstands of their own stories to distribute their content and find additional motivation to uh, join social media, be Twitter or, you know, use Facebook for professional purposes. Um, we also do uh, pay very close attention to our commenting section. Every single uh, comment uh, that gets submitted um, on postgazette.com gets read. Uh, we do use our social media platforms to solicit stories, to find new sources. So we do post sometimes solicitations um, about, you know, uh, how Affordable Care Act has uh, affected you. And if you know someone, please contact our reporter. We're uh, writing a story about it. Um, in terms of social media strategy, I think that, you know, um, the more uh, the, the more cognizant of it uh, you are of how fluid this whole sphere is in terms of you know developing and new platforms and uh, all variables that are affecting um, uh, your organization with multiple departments. You know we also work with sales and marketing department in making sure that uh, the Post Gazette has a unified voice. Um, but also, you know, with the reporters in, in particular, those who are not joining, you know, I always say, well, you can't cry unless you try. So you, you have to give a social media network tool a chance to succeed before you say that, you know, it's just for kids to tweet what they eat. Uh, I mean, we have all, you know, heard that um, argument, but I think that if, uh, you know, you are striving to attract new audiences and care about how far your content goes because there is no um, measurement to measure ho who actually reads the newspaper. I mean, you drop it on the doorstep and you actually don't know how many people opened or read, you know, your story. But with um, with a digital analytics tool and also social media reaction, you can get immediate feedback on your story. You can get immediate feedback on you know what you have written, and you can get immediate uh, feedback for a follow-up story, um, which I think has happened uh, with uh, some you know success uh, with some of our reporters. So um, I think our social media strategy is still in flux, uh, but we do strive for unified voice. Um, my personal account, I, I'm a lurker primarily on Twitter. A lot of my stuff is just to peruse what's going on in the news world, and. Um, 90% of my tweets are retweets. You know, I find this interesting. This is what I'm looking at, this I'm reading. Um, fortunately, we do have a policy and a strategy for us in place at Kitty K Radio. Whenever we tweet, when we're anchoring or report, pardon, reporting, um, we do it from the Kitty K Radio account. Um, and unlike public radio, where you do a lot more in-depth stories, we're doing, you know, breaking news every half hour. Here's where we're at at a standoff down on Boulevard of the Allies. Here's where we're at. One of our reporters are here. And we really treat it traditionally as like a traditional TV or radio tease when we're uh, tweeting, uh, when we're anchoring, coming up at 11, here's this, or we'll, we'll ask a question. So that strategy is in place as well as a policy that we're supposed to be tweeting at least once an hour if we're on any type of shift. Um, the comment on uh, the print folks here, um, as a consumer of news, I do appreciate uh, particularly the OR since they recently instantiated their paywall that They've told their reporters, at least I'm not trying to speak on behalf of our reporters, but they've told me that you know that's not changing their social media habits. They're still self-promoting as a newsstand, as you said. And I hope that continues for other organizations because I really do enjoy being able to have um, instant access to at least breaking news. I, I, I buy the New York Times the digital access, so I will pay for content for in-depth and long reads, but for like breaking news, I want you know reporters to still be sending out that stuff and how I view it is most valuable. Sending out man on the street type reports as soon as you're on scene and establishing that we have someone there and you can get a more in-depth report when you click back to that tune in link and listen online. I think Kim has a couple of questions from audience members. Yeah, a couple of good questions from audience members. Um, this one everyone can answer. Um, uh, two, I'll read the questions and I'll pass the mic around. Uh, I like how we ended up using one mic. You know, which the first one is, uh, what's the most creative way you have used social media as a journalist? And the other one is, uh, sort of related to my question about, or my comment that I made about being on 24-7, and the person wanted to know if pay scales have changed uh, 
are relevant to social media. I can answer that, but no, they have not. I don't anticipate them ever doing that. But I think that is a, a challenge that uh, you are you paying someone when they're tweeting on their own time? Are you, you know, is it their own time? Uh, how much do you do off hours? I think that depends on the journalist. Uh, I think that depends on, you know, the organization and kind of the rules of what's work and what isn't work. So I would be surprised if we saw formalized rules about that, but then again, maybe we will. I, I consider it, you know, part of my, I think as a good journalist, you're always paying attention to the news anyway. I mean, I'm, I have the TV on, or I listen to the radio, or I'm you know, watching Twitter because I, I want to make sure I'm up to speed. I think social media is another way to let you do that. And the most creative thing I've ever done on Twitter as a journalist, um, well, I like Twitter as a crowdsourcing tool. I think you have to be careful when you throw a question out there and say, hey, has anyone ever done this? Because we get a lot of this back at you. Uh, so you have to be careful and, and phrase your questions well and to know your audience. And don't ever try and invent a hashtag because that, that always goes south. Uh, as many brands have found out, uh, people will hijack your hashtag and then uh, everything goes you know, straight down. <laughs> Down the hole. Um, but what I, I actually had a story recently that I uh, crowdsourced via, um, and Mila retweeted it from the Post Gazette account. Um, and it was, I was doing a story on um, the end of Breaking Bad, and the, there's going to be a spin off um, show with the lawyer character. So I wanted to know how lawyers in Pittsburgh feel about this character on Breaking Bad, as sort of a, a jerk bag, sort of a sleazy lawyer, kind of the stereotypical lawyer. So I sent out a tweet saying, hey, Pittsburgh lawyers, I have a story idea, I promise it'll be fun, um, get in touch with me. Because the trick is I don't want to give it away so that Bobby sees it and says, hey, that's a great story idea, I'm gonna do that. And then you know, he sort of preempts this feature idea that I have, but I want to make sure I'm getting it out to other people. So there's a little bit of a skill to that. So you're not, if you're doing a story, you don't want your competition to know what you're up to, but you have to get a certain target audience. You have to be a little bit creative, so. Um, just real quick, if you yeah. want to uh, see some really bad made up hashtags on Twitter, follow Nancy Grace. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in terms of um, creative use of, was it just Twitter or was it social media? It was social media. Social media? Uh, I, I guess I sort of took a page out of Mila's book and started using Storify um, every now and then. Um, it, it's a really cool way to, to group a topic. Um, uh, I'll be honest, one of the story files I created and was when Justin Bieber came to town. <laughs> <laughs> Here's why, because it was hilarious looking at all of the tween Instagram photos and Twitter and, and tweets that were going out. Just the grammar and just all of the selfies. I'm glad were, that part to start to were hilarious <laughs> to, to look at. So, but but it was a but it, but it was a really cool you know use to sort of see what this demographic of people how they were using the internet, and that's maybe the most creative use. I mean, I the, what Kim described, I you know I do the same thing. You know, we'll we we'll sort of do the reporter one ad on Twitter. You know, we're looking for people for a story, want to be involved. I did that in September when Pittsburgh was named uh, one of the worst places to drive or bad drivers or whatever, I tweeted, you know, does anyone have any experience? And a couple of people replied to me. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, a couple, a couple of people wanted to, you know, to be part of the story, things like that. Um, but like Kim said, you do have to be creative in, in how you approach that topic. We're, we're sort of starting a, a project this month and we're, we're introducing it um, next week. And we're trying to sort of tiptoe around how we're going to ask people to respond because we don't want um, post Gazette or the Times or you know someone else to sort of um, sort of run with it as well. So so we sat and tried to figure out how we can um, get um, reader feedback via Twitter and Facebook without sort of spilling the beans as to what we're doing. By way of asking for for people's input, trying to hook up the sources that way. Um, I I, mean, I don't know how creative this is, but I like to have my Twitter client open up on my laptop next to me on the console. Just as a way of kind of seeing what Pittsburgh's mood is this morning, like how are we feeling, how's traffic, how's weather, how the Steelers do, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's just sort of a little running ticker in the, my peripheral vision, a, uh, a way to kind of get a 
feel for how things are going today. Um, uh, we, and I, I had nothing to do with this, but have been using Flickr as a way to aggregate, not aggregate, to gather uh, photos, user submitted photos. Uh, initially, uh, as a, just a general purpose engagement strategy, a way to connect with our listeners, um, they were running it as a contest at one point. I suppose it still is nominally. We still get regular submissions. Uh, Sort of the secret uh, purpose behind that initially, not, I don't know how secret it was, but um, we were launching a website from the ground up. Uh, we didn't have a lot of stock photos. We had a need for really good photos, uh, you know, creative content, or creative commons licensed photos uh, of things around Pittsburgh to include in our stories. And it was a way to quickly build an archive of that and people seem to enjoy it, seem to, uh, Enthusiastic about it. That's worked out really nicely for us. Both microphones. <laughs> um, I uh, personally, I use, I, I write a uh, kind of a consumer tech column once a week, and and that is an easy way. Some of that is the the audience that I have, uh, my, my my friends on my, my work Twitter account, my personal Twitter account. And I can I can send questions about whatever it is that I'm writing about, and I and I. In, in you guys, because it's some of you people out there, um, do a great job of responding with stuff that's way funnier than anything I could ever come up with. Um, and then, of course, I steal those and put those in the column um, with, with credit, of course. Uh, we're starting to do more, um, uh, trying to, to, to seek more engagement uh, with, with our readers. The, the, the biggest thing this fall, um, we've kind of completely revamped our uh, high school football coverage. Um, and, and I think the front page has already switched, so you can't see it now. But um, it, it, uh, using hashtags hasn't been much of, a, of an effort to hijack those yet. That still might come. Um, and also using uh, uh, tagging Instagram photos, and we've gotten some buy-in with that too. It's uh, it, it comes in very very small uh, doses, but um, this has sort of built up over the over the course of the season so far. So that's that's encouraging, uh, and I think um, if if we continue to be successful with that stuff, that that will continue. We'll, we'll spread that out into, into more facets of, of what we're covering. I think we have some good examples of how reporters in the newsroom ha have used Twitter and have gathered material for their stories, um, just like you know other newsrooms have. Um, uh, be, be, for example, uh, John Schmitz uses his uh, you know Twitter account to cover traffic in the morning, something that we cannot print in the newspaper because it, it's irrelevant news, um, you know, for that format. But you, um, and he has solicited a lot of feedback uh, with the help of the community groups. You know, he would put alerts and solicitations on, you know, bicyclists in Pittsburgh, let us know whether, you know, vehicle owners are following the rules and what are your complaints. Because, you know, we do pay attention to how uh, many comments um, which issue gets, and the bicyclist community is very active on our letters to the editor, which I think, you know, really warrants a section, a bicycling section in the paper, but, you know, it's a different conversation. My personal um, pride <laughs> is the Digs project, uh, which is a Tumblr plot project. It's uh, the address, if you're not familiar, is pgdigs.tumblr.com. It's a it's an effort to um, digitize our archive um, that dates back to 1900s when the newspapers first started part uh, started publishing um, photographs. And our morgue, as we call it, you know, has amazing, amazing amount of photos that have never been digitized and have been seen only, you know, only in the newspaper uh, a long time ago. And no matter whether you know you go look for personality or a building or a, a neighborhood, you know, you can find it in our archive. And it's fascinating journey, which has, um, re uh, which has resonated with the community. It's the most shared content on our Facebook page. It's um, the most, you know, uh, the feedback that we get is fascinating because people share their memories and share, you know, this, uh, Common history that we share with the with the with the citizens of Pittsburgh, um, and I think you know that 
uh, when you go back, you know, whether we're talking about the flood of 1936, and you see how many people have, you know, either family memories or they offer us, they call us and say, you know, I have photos from my grandmother. Uh, would you like to have those? And it's, it's fascinating. It reveals so many personal stories and so many great memories. So in terms of community feedback, I think uh, you know, it's been the most powerful uh, project that we have launched. But we experimented with Tumblr, uh, Tumblr afterwards, you know, uh, including uh, incorporating it in a Storify, sort of a Pittsburgh Marathon was a great um, uh, event to cover uh, using Storify because everybody was tweeting pictures. So we launched a Tumblr, Pittsburgh Marathon, that Tumblr.com, and embedded a bunch of Storifys into that Tumblr. So you see like cross-pollination of different platforms and the images and the Instagrams that were there from the community were pretty um, powerful. Of course, you know, I wish that there was a way to for us to uh, be more policy um, changing in a way we deal with our comments because you know you do still have to deal with um, people who are trolling threads and who are trying to um, obfuscate the discussion so and but sometimes it's it's the wealthiest uh, resource for us because it gives us you know the pulse of the community and what stories people care about and what we should cover more of so I think that if there was a way to just eliminate, um, you know, the noise, um, it would be even um, even more powerful. So we have been working on that. As far as the most creative um, usage, I am a hopeless traditionalist in the sense that social media, particularly Twitter, in its live element, is good enough for me. Uh, personally, when I was reporting on some things from my blog outside of KDK. It was enough just to use a video client, either Ustream or Livestream or another video client, and just tweeting that out and wherever I was at. Um, you mentioned the cross-pollination. Otherwise, I'm just linking back to other stories and linking back to what has been previously covered. Um, we're finding opposing views and including those in the same tweets, um, prefacing it as such. But otherwise, it's just the, the live element for me is enough that where I'm either on scene somewhere or um, I'm going to promote, be promoting somewhere where I'm going to be or someone else is going to be, and then finding relevant hashtags if, if, it's, if it calls for it. Um, but yeah, Twitter, I use it primarily for that. Facebook, if I want to kind of get a litmus test for what somebody thinks of something, I'll post it to Facebook. But I use Twitter much more uh, for perusing news and as well as promoting our own content. I was just going to put a quick plug for Mila's um, product, which has been sort of her. Uh, She's worked a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into pgdigs.tumblr.com is archive of PG photos. It's really fantastic. You should check it out if you haven't already. Award-winning and really worth your time and, and uh, really entertaining. All uh, credit for that goes to Mila and, and my hard work on it. So I just want to put a little plug in there. Okay. All right, I have some rapid-fire questions for you. Besides Facebook or Twitter, what is your favorite social media tool? I like Tumblr for its ease of use and its uh, uh, its simplicity. It doesn't have a lot of um, crap <laughs> on it. So it's, it's very easy to use, very straightforward. Uh, it has a very vibrant community. Uh, you get a lot of immediate feedback. People like your, your content on there. I also, I know that Bobby and I were sort of debating this. Uh, Google Plus, I think, has a lot of potential. I, I wish they could figure it out because it's, it looks beautiful. Uh, Google's going to really, I think, make it a, lot, a bigger part of its SEO strategy. Uh, you're going to really need to be on Google Plus to, to get your content seen, to get your content found in searches. I think that's just going to become more and more uh, prevalent. Uh, but I think I wish that they could get it so it was a little bit, they caught on more. It just it ha hasn't found that sort of magic sauce or whatever that, that Facebook has or that Tumblr has or that Twitter has. And I hope that they do because you don't want people to be going there because they feel like they have to for marketing purposes or for PR purposes, but because it's a really beautiful platform. It looks really nice and it, it photos look great on there. And um, I, mean, I do think it helps your, your Google search results, uh, particularly when you pair it with other tools that are available. So 
But I would say for me, Twitter is my sort of primary, and then Tumblr and Facebook um, would be uh, it's probably two and three. Real quick, just a show of hands, how many of you are a actively use Google Plus? It's actually not enough. <laughs> okay, Bobby, favorite social media tool? Go. Uh, besides Twitter and Facebook, it's Storify. Definitely, I like that you can group. Um, you can group social media. You can group people's reactions from a multitude of social media platforms. Definitely Storify. Yeah, and like everybody else, I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with Google Plus, and I think the same can be said if you know my station. Uh, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with it, but I like it. Everything that I would be doing on Facebook, if I still had it in me to like participate in Facebook, I'm doing on Google Plus now. I like that I can sort of uh, control a little bit better, you know, who sees it, and I just like the way it looks. It's cool. Uh, I've been pretty agnostic on Instagram, but I'm coming around. I like the way other people are using it. I'm not uh, jumping in that pool yet, but I, I see cool stuff. I'm kind of like Instagram. Right now. Uh, as I said, we started using Instagram, and I, I think that has a lot of promise. Um, actually, getting our photographers to, to play around with Instagram, um, they're slowly buying into that. But uh, that's, they're going to they're going to produce some really really cool stuff when uh, when when they start using the platform. Um, I'm I I, I I still like YouTube. I, I'm I'm a, I, I, the, the video stuff that I've done for the paper. Um, uh, it's is uh, it's all there. Uh, it's easy for us to work with just in terms of our site, um, and I think my video stuff is sort of in in, in a hiatus at the moment. But um, but I, we will continue to use that once uh, once I get my stuff started back up again. Um, I don't use Vine that much, but the stuff that I see there fascinates me. You know how creative people are in trying to. Uh, use video in a very, you know, short uh, clip and how they are using it uh, to, for reporting. I do like to embed it into Storify. I love vines. Um, some of the stuff that came out of Pittsburgh Marathon is pretty fascina fascinating. And, you know, the rubber duck too. Um, so that was very interesting to see how the community responded on vine uh, with um, you know, with events like this, which are very colorful. And um, uh, Instagram, of course, Google Plus, I think that I use it more for personal purposes. I wish that we would integrate it more into the newsroom. But if you are a, a website publisher, do look into Google authorship. Just Google it and sign up, because it does gonna, it, it is gonna affect uh, the, your Google search results and how you are showing up in Google search results. I have, you know, integrated it and signed up several reporters in our newsroom to Google Authorship Program. So now, you know, um, we have noticed a significant difference in how uh, far ahead we're appearing on Google search. Especially, you know, I think for sports writers, for people who cover um, you know, non-exclusive content, it does make a huge difference. So if you are, um, you know, having, if, you're, if you have a website, you're a web publisher, um, do look into Google authorship. It's very easy and straightforward, just Google it. I too uh, like YouTube the best as far as a content distribution, content creation, it has all you know your basic HTML sets that you can just write into the page, and it's very easy, intuitive, and it's been around forever. You know, the, uh, speaking to, to the Google, it's a Google asset. I want to come around to Google Plus, um, but I just haven't found much utility in being the first adopter in it. I still have an account, um, but it, to me, I just don't see as much utility in. It's, I guess it would be more time management to to decide which stories you want certain people to see and which you don't. Um, and lastly, I am fascinated by Vine, but I'm utterly frustrated by it because I suck at it. I really <laughs> suck at Vines. <laughs> it's just certainly, it's created a lot of 21st century comedians, but I could I cannot use it in a new sense without it being, it just doesn't come off as compelling. I'm here at, at the new scene. There's a six second still shot of the new scene, whatever it is. Um, 
And it free, it's, if I can criticize a little bit more, we're letting go of the mic. It's, see, it's been freezing up on me a lot lately. I don't know if uh, the Instagram video video works for better, but the whole appeal to me was its intuitiveness of getting things on Twitter as quickly as possible, as opposed to something in iPhone you have to export it, what have you. Um, so if there are other video services out there that allow you a longer time and not force you to that time constraint, I'd be all for it. YouTube is my favorite. Um, still trying to figure out Google Plus how I would, how I would use it the best. Okay, that was not rapid fire at all, but <laughs> these people have good things to say, so I'll allow it. But for the next question, you get one answer, one, one choice, there. and one sentence to explain why. I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to start with David. What is your favorite Pittsburgh Twitter account? Favorite Pittsburgh Twitter account? Um, I think Scott Harbaugh of PXI, speaking of uh, Twitter accounts, he, he ma masters a vine. Um, he, he has ridden the professional and comedy line to a fault. He really does it well. Okay. I do have to give my vote to FS Mike. <laughs> This is hard. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go with Jane. Uh, okay. Jane Pitt? Yeah. Yeah. Jane Pitt. Uh, she covers everything in the, in the city and, and uh, it's like her sense of humor. Uh, I'm a big fan of John Schmitz. I actually use his Twitter feed a lot. Uh, in, like trying to compile my traffic reports such as they are. We're using a lot of very spotty kind of web-based resources and John always seems to know exactly what's going on and what's important about it. So I, I use him as a cheat sheet. And I also, like, he's interested in transportation and bike issues and I'm interested in a lot of the same stuff. So I get that little dopamine kick every time I see his uh, Twitter go by. Um, uh, I would have to um, break the rule a little bit on the question. Mike and Bob from Kiss FM. FS Mikey and FS Big Bob, both of them are awesome. Um, I would agree, but I think my favorite Pittsburgh Twitter is someone who isn't here today who I wish was, because I think he's a big part of Pittsburgh social media and podcast, is uh, Roy, is my boy check. Yeah. Um, definitely personality, but and always has links that I cannot imagine how he dug them up, where he found them. Interesting stuff and a nice guy, a genuine guy, and it, it very much comes across in his Twitter. So I would say Woy is my favorite Pittsburgh Twitter poll. Okay. Uh, this next question comes from Deanna at Pretty in Pittsburgh, and she asks, How has getting reliable sources changed as social media has become an accepted practice? Uh, she says, I feel everyone wants to be first, but sometimes that isn't always reliable. How do you balance being quick and credible? I, I think you, if you have to pick one, you have to be credible. And I think everyone remembers, no one remembers if you're first and, and right. They remember if you're first and wrong. I think we care in the media more about being first than the public does. The public wants reliable information. They don't care if I had it first or if Bobby had it first or if Katie Kay had it first. They care that the information I'm giving is accurate. Um, so for me personally, Twitter has not changed how I source information. I am a responsible journalist who, who corroborates information that's given to me and verifies information. And I treat Twitter as I would any other source of information, be it a phone call or a news tip or a court document. Or I treat it with the same level of skepticism I would treat any other information I had not personally corroborated. Um, and I think you know, being first is becoming more and more overrated because in a breaking news event, Twitter's an echo chamber. Everyone's treating the same information and treating the same links. What are you bringing to the table that's, that's helping someone understand how does this news affect you? How does this news affect me? Why, why am I reporting this news? How, what's the impact on Pittsburgh? So I think you know, we should be a lot less worried about being first and, and more worried as we should be about being right and being relevant. Yeah, the worst thing a reporter has to do is go back on his word um, from what they've said. And if you want to be credible, you have to make sure it's right before it's first. Um, I, if I don't get it out there first, uh, I mean, we run a different ship with the trip because many of our newspapers are um, community newspapers that come out once a week in print or online, you know, like uh, all the time anyway. But 
So we have a little bit more time to build a story, develop the story, so, um, and, and that helps a lot. But um, the worst thing a reporter can do when they're trying to gain trust through social media is have, a, have wrong information out there. It, it's the worst thing ever. We're a really small shop. We, it's not really part of our ethos to be there first in the first place just because we, we probably couldn't. We've gotten lucky on a few occasions. Uh, we, we, Deanna Garcia was in the right place at the right time for the, um, the Western Psych shooting. She got to Gateway Center pretty quickly for that. But apart from those kinds of things, we don't really do a lot of breaking news. So it hasn't been a huge issue for us. But you know, when one of these guys is out there and has the story, one of your, one of your reporters, uh, and it's you know it's a credible reporter. It's somebody that I know and trust. I feel comfortable retweeting those often. And I guess there's a whole other discussion we can have about you know retweets or not endorsements. What about you know it, if I retweet you? Uh, can we yeah. for the record like just ban that from ever like ever? If, if you think that a reporter retweeting you is an endorsement, really? I don't think anyone thinks that. I hope not. Anyway. I mean, I think we should just ban that phrase from the lexicon because. Of course they're not endorsing. No, reporters don't endorse anybody, they hate everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, for me, social media hasn't, in, in, in terms of this question, social media hasn't changed anything. It's, it, it's a source, and it, like any source, um, you need to check and verify. Um, uh, like any source, it, it can start you down the path to be a really good story, but, but you have to do all the other work that's required. Um, so in that respect, um, it has, hasn't changed anything that I do. I think it has added a great layer of aggravation and frustration because you actually are looking at the tweets that you know are coming out from other news organizations and you are wondering, you know, and the reporters are saying, no, I have checked with the sources, that's not the credible information. And it does add, you know, this um, like, Really, you're getting antsy, and you know you like want to tweet and to confirm this news. Just like um, I don't remember who exactly tweeted. One of the TV stations recently tweeted fire in Oakland, devastating, da da da. And we went into you know checking it, and our reporter, our poor reporter, called every single you know corner of Oakland, and it turned out to be in California. So you know it was like, uh, and we were <laughs> we were. And it was a local TV station. Yeah, so we do treat it as a tip. Um, I think the most uh, you can do in social media space is to find um, uh, tips and then uh, follow along your you know, reporter's um, ethical guidelines on how you would treat a tip. Um, you would verify and confirm. And you know, I think that in, in Pennsylvania, we did have several cases where uh, reporters were too um, quick to confirm the news or relied on unreliable source or saw the news or the national news organization reporting something um, false. I mean, it happened this year um, uh, with, uh, with the Boston Marathon shooting. You now we rely on Associated Press. And uh, when they said that you know, the shooters have been apprehended, we published a story because it was Associated Press story, and um, you know tweeted it, posted it on Facebook, um, and then it turned out to be wrong. And of course, I mean, people who, who go to our website and read the story, they do not read the byline. They, I mean, we are responsible for the content that we share and for the information that we carry, um, and that was, you know, that was such a huge. Um, I think uh, lesson to learn that you know not only a tweet can be wrong, but even the source can be wrong, and every single uh, tip of information should be treated as. Yeah, just that going and building upon all that. Just when it down, leave it out. We're unfortunately KDK Radio demands a commercial radio. We find out something, we're under a mandate to promote something, even if it's to promote something coming up at the top of the hour. Dave Singer is going to say he doesn't know this, he doesn't know this, but he does know this. So we're under that type of mandate to under commercial radio. Um, but if I don't know something and someone else is reporting it, I'll at least attribute it and then follow up on it later. Yeah, we have to promote that we're coming up to say we don't know what's going on. 
Okay, we have just a couple minutes here. So does anyone from the audience have a quick question that they weren't able to tweet? Um, I'm sorry? Pinterest. Pinterest. Oh. Anyone here? Go ahead, Bill. I use it as a, uh, as a personal tool to organize the books that I want to read and uh, to, you know, to sort of pin the places I want to visit. In our news organization, it has been a very successful tool for Doug Oster, who is our gardening guru. And he has been he has been loving that tool. You know, he uh, posts on his blog something about tomatoes or you know bugs or spiders, and then he would take photos and pin them. And he has a crazy following on Pinterest. So for him, you know, for his type of content, which is very visual, and he's also a photographer and videographer, it has worked very well. Um, I think that you know a lot of our I hear a lot of our followers who uh, wanted the digs, for example, to be um, appearing on Pinterest as well, so they could pin those photos that are appearing on Tumblr. But we haven't got around to it. We do try to keep live, but um, you know the only real success story that we had inside the newsroom was with Doug Oster and him using it um, as a tool to spread his content on gardening and his gardening tips. Anyone else? Anyone want to add anything before we wrap up here real quick? We have one more here. Oh. Okay. Sure. Uh, so um, my question is about the comment sections on uh, the website. Um, are, no comments on comments. Don't read the comments. <laughs> yeah, there are crazy problems with them in terms of post craziness. But um, I've also seen points where, like, a news article is very ethical in not reporting stuff that, say, police haven't released yet, like the name of a murder victim. Uh, and then, like, their cousin posts in the comment section, like, I can't believe that Sheila is dead. And, like, there's a lot of sort of ethical problems that happen when you guys aren't releasing stuff. But the comment section is this open season on speculation and weirdness. Um, I guess my question is, like, does that ever become problematic for you guys? And, like, what happens when, like, an article goes to the comment section that spirals out of control? <laughs> I'm going to let Mila deal with that one. She's the one who deals with the headings of the comment most often. It, it, but it does happen. We, yeah, you know how many there have been cases where we got um, almost sued? We had to file a police, we had to, um, we have been contacted by some authorities about the commenting section. Um, because you know there have been uh, some outrageous claim and death threats, um, we do take them very seriously because you know none of the news organizations uh, wants to establish a legal precedent to be sued on what appears in the commenting section. That's why I think you know we do actually allocate resources for reading every single comment. Yes, it's time consuming. Uh, yes, it might not be the smartest way to um, allocate your resources. But if you care about community feedback and wants to uh, and wants to avoid libel and all those, you know, um, legal uneasy cases, you should treat them very seriously. There have been a lot of complaints, especially from the bicyclist community, because our letters to the editor. In, you know anything that has to do with bicycling and rules on on the road have gone totally out of control. You know there have been threats of people going around and then screwing you know screws in your bike and how you know you think you're wearing spandex and you're so cool. Uh, think, you know like and then all the ridiculous this uh, discourse just gets um, out of hand. So we do have to watch then to assign a person to watch commenting threads. There have been a lot of, unfortunately, you know, I have to say that, but 
um, we have been really careful in enabling comments um, on articles um, about, you know, the hill, about the Wil uh, Wilkinsburg community, because all of those generate this, um, you know, disgusting racist speak. It's just amazing. I mean, I, I'm sort of, you know, every time I want to, to sort of leave the benefit of the doubt uh, with the community, I get disappointed. And uh, we learned the hard way that we have to close that commenting section down because it just spirals into this, uh, you know, hate speech that I don't think that, um, you know, uh, we should uh, provide forum for. Uh, so it's been it's been a very tough area to navigate, um, at least uh, for us at the Post Gazette. Yeah, just real quick, the, the paywall helped help with some of our commenting problems because many of those people were not subscribers. They were just there to do the thing in the comment section, and we lost a lot of them. Um, uh, we mentioned the Hill and Wilkinsburg and uh, the Alquip and Beaver Falls. But the same responses. Uh, unfortunately, it's forced me to be kind of heavy handed because I, I don't have the staff or the time to read through everything. And when we see something, I just click button, comments are turned off. And that's not how it should be, but that's uh, the reality of what we have to, to deal with and, and how we deal with that problem. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I don't think we have time for any more questions, unfortunately. But, uh,